Good afternoon. Jane Barrett here. Um, some of you are probably wondering why we're actually talking about vision health in an ageing conference. And it's important to set the scene because IFA has been very interested in this area of work for some time now. There are many factors that impact and enable healthy ageing, such as where we live, the lifestyle, decisions that we make, and the conditions that we have, such as chronic conditions such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But we also want to consider, you know, what are the safe and effective treatments for those chronic conditions? I think what we need to understand, though, is rooted in ageism is the myth that vision deterioration is just a normal fact of life. And I wonder if I asked you today how many of you remember when you last had your eyes tested? Was it in the last year? Was it in the last two years? Um, also, whether you had a comprehensive ophthalmological screening. When was the last time that you actually visited and had a conversation with an ophthalmologist? And IFA has asked these things because vision loss is one of the most feared losses in our life. And there's been some good evidence to, to suggest that we fear the loss of vision more than we fear the loss of a limb. So as we go forward in thinking about healthy ageing, IFA has been very interested in understanding the impact of vision loss in the context of healthy ageing. So let me just put it very simply, that someone with vision impairment because that they haven't been able to afford to go to have their eyes screened, or they haven't had that conversation with an ophthalmologist who has identified that they have diabetic retinopathy or they have age macular disease, they're living alone, they fall, they're admitted into an acute care setting with a fractured neck of femur or a fractured wrist, and because they don't have family and friends around them, because they live in a country area in New South Wales or in Canada or in India, um, they don't have that service provision, that care arrangement to support them to return home. But more than that, they actually don't have the social mobility to be part of community. And this may then lead to anxiety, depression, and significant loneliness and mental disturbances. So if we trace our steps back and think, what would have happened if in the country that that person was living in, that eye tests were reimbursable, they were free? And I was saying to Louise, Louise Gillis, president of the Canadian Council of the Blind, just in the speaker's room, that when I go onto radio with accessible media, you know, one of the questions that I'm going to get from a Canadian is, I haven't been able to afford to go and get my eyes tested. So one of the reasons that IFA is so passionate about this, not only in Canada, but also globally, is that it impacts a person's functional ability so it's our responsibility to be part of creating that enabling political, social and economic environment to enable that older person to have that screening, to have that conversation with their ophthalmologist and to be able to have safe and effective treatment for that eye condition. Because quite often the eye condition you know, there's a window of opportunity that can actually not only slow down the disease process, but in some cases improve it. And that's why this conversation is critical. Many of you that are part of ageing organisations, you know, I ask you to go and look at your agenda and see if vision health is on the agenda. And most of you, the answer will be no. So my job today is to introduce the context for this session. 
It's also to give you a broad brush about what the session's about. And as you can see, you know, we are very honoured to have with us today Dr William Lee, CEO, President and Medical Director of the Angiogenesis Foundation. And we have a panel of which I'm one of the members, but most importantly, Dr John Beard, Miss Louise Gillis, and Dr David Wong, Ophthalmologist-in-Chief, St Michael's Hospital here in Canada. And uh, I thank Dr Wong in particular for not breaking the speed limit from getting to Oakville to Toronto to be part of this panel. So thank you, Dr Wong. It's now a pleasure to introduce Dr William Lee. Um, Will is a physician. He's a scientist, he's an innovator and global health advocate. Um, and the words say it all to me. He has an intrepid vision, and you'll hear it when you listen to him. He has this urgency. He's one of these guys that says, why not? Why aren't we doing this? We can do it. I'll do it. Let's to do it together. That's the kind of person Will is. And I've will, known Will probably five or six years. It doesn't change. You know, Will's just finished a book. How many books have you written now? Just one. Just one. <laughs> Only one. But it says here that you've authored more than 100 scientific publications. And I'm telling you these things about Will because it's important when you, when you hear him, you know, believe him. Because he's one of those people that looks for the common denominators that both transform the biotechnology world and preventative health. I think the other thing that struck me is you know, his passion in the development of the Angiogenesis Foundation. And he has groundbreaking work that has led to the successful development of 32 game-changing drugs and devices used to destroy cancer, halt and reverse vision loss, and speed the healing of chronic wounds associated with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and aging. So you're in for a treat this afternoon, not only with Will, but the panelists here. So please help me to warmly welcome Dr. William Lee. Well, thank you for your kind words, Jane, and I, uh, and the opportunity to come and speak today. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, give you an address that is uh, in the theme of aging, but looking at the problems of vision. And I want to thank the International Federation of Aging for organizing uh, the entire the totality of the events and for Jane's vision. For the past hundred years or so, medical research has enabled us to significantly extend the longevity uh, of people, especially in developed countries. And it's really partly due to the biopharmaceutical and medical device and diagnostic uh, tools that have developed that allow us in medicine to change the way that we approach disease. And there are even more exciting advances on the horizon. And so the promise of conquering diseases, even cancer, seem more likely to be realized today than ever before. But as the world population has grown to more than 7.6 billion, and the proportion of the older population is also increasing, we have to focus our attention on the more than 600 million people over the age of 65 and their needs, which includes vision. By 2050, that number will be about 1.6 billion worldwide. So this is a problem that is actually going to grow and needs that are also going to grow. So at the sessions throughout this conference, there have been some pretty provocative and important issues that have been raised. For example, how are we going to ensure that members of our aging population are going to have fulfilling lives and not just longer lives? 
How will we ensure that the faculties that they have, not only physical, but also mental, uh, cognitive, um, are going to be fully maintained to the length that's possible? And how are these solutions that we still have yet to find, how will they be equitably delivered to everyone in the aging community, regardless of where they live and what their socioeconomic status is? These are issues that have to be addressed really by multi-stakeholder collaborations by engaging the types of groups, the diverse groups, such as have gathered here uh, for this conference, and together is really what it's going to take to help uh, uh, improve healthy aging. But I'd like to suggest that there is another important question, and that question surrounds whether or not aging equals disease. Because if we want healthy aging, we're going to have to do better and intervene more effectively and support the community before disease actually sets in. So think about the model of Humpty Dumpty on the wall and falling down and picking all the pieces. If we approach aging just by looking at the egg after it's broken and trying to figure out how to put it together, we've missed the opportunity to actually look at the intact egg to figure out how to adjust it so it's sitting better on the wall so it won't fall. And that's an important analogy to make because the biggest health threats to the aging population are the non-communicable diseases. For example, cardiovascular disease, um, which includes heart attack, stroke, uh, uh, diabetes, uh, cancer, and of course, also neurodegenerative diseases. And here's the rub. These are killers that we don't know how to cure, even in the younger population. And so it's not like we have a solution for younger ages. We just need to find a way to get them to an older population. We don't even quite know how to deal with them uh, among the youthful uh, segment of the population. So we need to take an entirely different approach. And uh, to understand how to actually achieve healthy aging. And there are some very important clues to follow, I believe. If you look at Japan, for example, it has one of the oldest populations of centenarians, people that are 100 years older, 100 years or older uh, in the world. And these people can enjoy a relatively high quality of life. In 2017, there were 67,824 people older than 100 living in Japan. And the numbers are uh, set to grow. What you're seeing here on the screen is the pop music band in Japan called KBG48 from Kohama Island in Okinawa. This is a rock band, music band, pop music band that's formed by centenarians. And this might be one depiction of healthy aging. And in fact, throughout the world, there are very old individuals who are enjoying their ninth or tenth decades, living and fulfilling the definition of having a long and a good life. So a major question is, what allows people to age and to thrive at the same time? Clearly, aging by itself is not synonymous with disease. And yet in the medical community to which I belong, we do make this assumption. It is baked into the way we are trained. It is baked into the sickness that we see in the clinic. And it is baked into the mindset that we communicate with as physicians to our policymakers as well. And so we wind up actually steering a culture of ageism being equivalent to diseasesism, and that's not necessarily how we get to healthy aging. And in fact, we have many definitions for diseases afflicting the elderly, but, what, but when it comes to defining health, we don't do so well. In fact, we have relatively little knowledge about what's responsible for health in, um, uh, uh, in any population, but especially aging. For example, we know that cancer is caused by mutations in our DNA, and yet we also know that there are more than 10,000 natural errors in our DNA that as our cells divide every single day. But why don't we get more cancer? We don't know the answer to that. 
We also know that microbes cause infections, and we're now realizing that the microbiome, the healthy bacteria that live in our bodies, are important for our health. In fact, there are 37 trillion bacteria that live in our bodies. So we are infected, and yet we are not sick. How can that be? We don't know the answer to that. And we know that aging weakens our defenses against diseases like cancer, and yet in the modern era of cancer immunotherapy, we know that somebody who was in their 80s or even 90s, my mother is 83, can mount a immune defense that's capable of completely eradicating metastatic cancer in ways that chemotherapy cannot. So how is that possible? if somebody in their 80s or 90s actually has an immune system that is strong enough to be able to remove and eliminate all sign of clinical disease with cancer. And there's yet another frontier to be explored, and that's how our diet and our environments impact on our health, because healthy diets foster healthy communities. But how does food actually influence the cellular functions of our bodies beyond the traditional principles of nutrition, that's sugar, energy, glucose, metabolism. These are really modern questions that uh, uh, are being explored by my organization, the Angiogenesis Foundation. And in fact, this past April, I announced at the Vatican's Unite to Cure conference in Rome a new global initiative called the Health Expedition, which is being led by the Angiogenesis Foundation. The Health Expedition is being tasked to coordinate the efforts of an international coalition of scientists to define markers of health and health defense across the ages from young uh, development all the way until one gets old with collaborations between academia, government, and industry. It's going to use the tools of molecular genomics, metagenomics, population biology, and artificial intelligence to ask the question, why don't we get sick more often? And when it comes to aging, the health expedition is asking, what happens to our health as we age? What changes occur uh, in healthy aging? And how does our body's ability to resist disease change over the years? And how do we optimize this? These, we believe, are some of the core efforts that the Angiogenesis Foundation will undertake that can help unlock the fundamental principles of healthy aging. And in many ways, it's a rethink of the idea of healthy aging because we're interested in understanding what are the health defense systems that protect us as we go, get older, and not only what are the diseases that strike us um, as we age. Defense is pretty easy to understand in almost every sector of our lives. Many of us have dogs that help to guard our properties and our homes. Um, those of you who flew in today uh, will have gone through a, uh, a security system like this, as I did when I flew from Boston. This is guarding the homeland defense. And of course, the military is a long-held tradition of defense uh, for nations. But when we think of um, health defense in the body, we think of aging in terms of five health defenses that we think form part of the pillars of health. And that is angiogenesis, which is how the body grows in circulation, regeneration, stem cells that help us uh, rejuvenate our uh, bodies, uh, our microbiome, as I mentioned, is the healthy gut bacteria, uh, DNA protection, uh, and also our immune system. So these defenses are also helping us resist diseases, those non-communicable diseases of aging, and they play a role in keeping us from having cardiovascular disease, or cancer, or diabetes, or obesity, or neurodegeneration. And they prevent us from having vision loss. And that's the topic of this symposium. Vision loss is critical for healthy aging. Our eyes have to be healthy in order for us to be able to read, to cook, to eat our food, to socialize with our friends and family. And healthy vision is critical for us to be able to self-manage our diseases, for us to be able to check our blood sugar, 
for us to be able to inject our insulin, for us to be able to read which bottle contains our blood pressure medicine, for us to be able to remember from the calendar what day we are actually going to our follow-up exam with our doctor, including our eye doctor. So one of the most important diseases of vision in aging is called wet, the wet form of age-related macular degeneration. This is where blood vessels are growing uh, in the back of the eye, uh, and all of these defense systems are clearly deranged. When blood vessels are abnormally growing under the retina, which is the nerve layer in the back of the eye, they leak fluid and they destroy vision. The uh, microbiome, uh, which is in our gut, affects our immune system, which affects our inflammation and our metabolism, including our sugar, uh, and also can create um, uh, free radicals or oxidants that can damage the back of the eye. Uh, the DNA repair system is, dam is uh, faulty, and there is DNA damage in the telomeres, which actually occur um, as shortening and with aging. Uh, and uh, the immune system is also part of the inflammatory system. And if you talk to your ophthalmologist about what might be going on in the aging eye, chronic inflammation doing, due to the deposit of lipid or fat is uh, one of the very problems of macular degeneration. And finally, we know that stem cells also live in the retina and they're supposed to be able to repair um, uh, tissue, but in the case of macular degeneration, they're not able to regenerate, so you have degeneration. And in fact, we know that dietary factors can influence these defense systems as well, and that they can boost their activity uh, to prevent macular degeneration. Now, the stem cells are actually starting to show that they might have some benefit. In fact, in March of this spring, uh, it was announced that there were two patients in a phase one early clinical trial who received a stem cell patch with in patient, and they had macular degeneration and it was able to assist them in restoring their reading capacity. So it's not just about destroying something or stopping something, it's also about growing the tissue. Again, defending our aging body in ways that bring us back to uh, normal. Now, the dietary factors are also important because that is the one intervention that we do three times a day from the time we're born until the time we die. We make decisions on foods that we eat, and there are now efforts being made by nutritionists, molecular biologists, population scientists that are examining the links between our diet and our health and our vision. And in fact, we know that high consumption of fish, nuts, foods containing uh, bioactives called lutein and zeaxanthin, for example, they lower your risk of macular degeneration, whereas high consumption of red meat and trans fats increase that risk. That sounds like a common theme because those same types of patterns um, lower your risk of heart disease or raise your risk of heart disease, other diseases of aging. And in an important study called ARIDS-1, a cohort was studied, a small group was studied by researchers at Tufts and at Harvard in the United States. This is a group of 2,500 2, people that showed that those who ate a, had a high adherence to eating a Mediterranean-style diet had a 26% decreased risk of disease progression if they had macular degeneration. And importantly, the Mediterranean diet has also had beneficial influences on all of the five health defense systems I've showed you. And here's some of the data we've collected at the health expedition that shows the impact of foods that lower the risk of one disease that might also help lower the risk of other diseases as well. Many of these foods belong to the Mediterranean diet, and so now you have common foods that impact common pathways that help to alter, enhance, and perhaps restore defenses within the body. But observational studies are not enough. And when it comes to diseases of aging, we also now have more precise tools to be able to better understand the differences between 
an elderly person or an elderly population that is healthy and functional, like the Okinawans I showed you, compared to people who are elderly and suffering from diseases, like those non-communicable diseases of aging or vision loss. And with these types of tools, precise tools, we can examine the impact of diet, lifestyle, environment, genetics, the concomitant or diseases they have at the same time, and even their medications. And at the molecular level, we think this will give us a deeper understanding of what healthy aging actually means. Now, I'm going to actually just end my portion of this um, plenary by, uh, with a brief kind of discussion about the disease side of the equation. And we're going to look at this side of the equation because this is the model. This is the, where the current thinking actually is on aging. It's, it's on the disease level at the research side, at the clinical delivery side for doctors, and also, I would argue, at the policy side. And the reason that I'm arguing about uh, this, I think there's an argument to be had on this side of the equation, is because from a biomedical perspective, as a doctor and a researcher, I can tell you that we can no longer make oversimplified assumptions about how the new treatments that work on those defense systems, including angiogenesis, which is a problem in macular degeneration, we can't make simple judgments about how these treatments actually work. Sid Mukherjee, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and a physician, uh, uh, really uh, described very eloquently the problem of oversimplification in looking at diseases and their treatments today. He said the paradigm of medicine in the last 100 years have been, has been largely modeled after the antibiotic revolution, and you can say it in six words, which is have a disease, take a pill, and kill something. But when it comes to these diseases of aging, it's not that simple. It's really complicated, otherwise we would have already had successful ways to completely control cardiovascular disease or uh, neurodegeneration, and we don't yet. And so um, the, the problem in most diseases of aging is that the biology is much more complex than, for example, treating a pneumonia in an older person. We have effective treatments for vision loss, like anti-VEGF therapies. We're going to talk a little bit about that with the panel. These are medicines that neutralize proteins that grow those leaky blood vessels, and they can actually um, uh, stop the vision loss in many patients, but not all patients, and not all patients in the same way. And we're still working out, we're still wor trying to find, figure out, doing the research on the best way to treat these individuals. Now, I'm at the Angiogenesis Foundation, so I know a lot about anti-VEGF or anti-blood vessel treatments, and I can tell you that we see these patterns. We know you can give the same drug and have some people respond really well, and some people don't respond so well at all, and sometimes the people who respond well will, over time, lose that positive response, and they become a weaker responder or a poor responder, and we don't know why that actually is. And for this reason, there are choices of different treatments that doctors now have to select one treatment over another in order to be able to fine tune the patient to match the uh, situation of the patient with the right treatment for that particular disease. We also know that there are patterns where the patients respond to an anti-VEGF injection for macular degeneration very early on, but then they actually lose their response very quickly, early progressors, or others that actually respond pretty well, and then slowly, 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 they begin to lose the effect that we're hoping for. And this is another reason why we need the treatment of this condition, like many diseases of aging, to be tailored to the highly individual situation. And these individual decisions really rely on that communication between the doctor and the patient and having the tools that are available to them. And that it's a qualified expert that at the time of seeing that patient that makes that decision. Now at the end of the day, our biggest goal is to keep our age, the aging members of our population in the most normal, healthiest state possible. 
And to focus on healthy aging, we actually have to have all the available tools at our disposal because everyone is different. You've heard about the term precision medicine or individualized medicine, and that is where the entire field of medicine is going. We are no longer having cookie cutter treatments, one size fits all, and this is especially true in aging. Every individual has their own particular circumstances and situations, and when you treat them, they will actually require different tailoring, even of the same type of treatment, so we need to actually um, figure that out. So while there's a lot of work to be done ahead of us, the tools are now in our hands, and so our responsibility lies in making the best possible decisions and, and having uh, the tools accessible for us so we can give them to everyone who needs them. Thank you very much. So we're going to now go to a panel discussion to begin discussing uh, more specifically the challenges of vision loss in aging and some of the policies um, that are uh, being uh, uh, in place and being constructed and some of the dilemmas that exist. We have Dr. Wong, who is a retinal specialist, an eye doctor, uh, um, uh, Jane Barrett, who has been an advocate and a champion for all the diseases of aging. We've got John Beard, who is uh, the director of aging at the World Health Organization. Of course, um, broadly speaking, uh, the mandate on aging. Louise Gillis, who is the president um, of a vision organization representing the interests of patients. I can't think of a better group to actually bring together uh, to be able to look at um, three different themes that we're going to have some interactive conversation and hopefully some lively discussion about that I'm going to moderate. One has to do with just the issues of vision loss in the aging population, including the medical and some of the biology aspects. The other one is really about access and having those tools that I mentioned and, and choice. And then the third is the issue about policy and how policies are derived and how the policies that are made impact on lives. So I'd like to maybe start with uh, Dr. Wong uh, uh, and have him kind of as an um, ophthalmologist uh, tell us a little bit about uh, here in Canada, what are some of the global issues of vision loss from aging and what we're able to do with the treatments at hand, those tools I was talking about, and how, you, how that impacts how you service and provide help to your patients. Well, th thank you, William, for the, those questions. You know, as you line, uh, outlined in your, your, your talk there, um, vision is very important, and everyone here is looking at us up here, and you're using your vision, and it's all that independence. So it's a very impact, and as, when, as aging, is the two big diseases that are coming out from the retina is macular degeneration, which you're hearing a lot about now, and diabetes, and those two affect significantly the visual loss. Years ago, we did not have great treatments for it. So our, our treatment strategies back then was to preserve or limit the visual loss. And I can tell you when I started, it was like, okay, we're gonna hopefully in five years, you won't be legally blind type attitude. Whereas today, with the technology and all that's come forth, we're actually saying we can actually completely, hopefully stabilize your vision and long-term even improve your vision. And that's through these new drugs, and they're called biologics. And these are drugs made from biological materials that we use. And it's kind of scary, we kind of think, now we actually inject these into the eye. And it works fantastic. Like this is the time when I actually said, I'm actually doing something where I can improve someone's vision uh, to the point where they can go back and drive a car. They can read. They can see their grandchildren. Those are things that 20 years ago we would not do. So the impact, I think, with these biologics, these injections, these new drugs are fantastic. And they are really the, the, the forefront of where we're going to be moving towards uh, our care. And you know, this is just one of many things. And you know, this weekend, I'm actually going for another research meeting where we're going to talk about some new biologics and new studies we're building. So I think that it's exciting future that we do have these biologics, but the visual loss is quite significant uh, if you don't use these, these medications. So I think the impact uh, is, is significant that we're changing. 
Great. I'd like to go to Louise because I think that when you hear the doctor's point of view about being excited to be able to help transform their practice, at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is to help the individual, the patient. So Louise, from your perspective, what you've seen over the course of your work in vision, um, can you talk to us a little bit about how, how a patient reacts or responds to what you just heard Dr. Wong talk about? Yes, sure. Uh, first off, I want to explain a little bit about my organization. I'm calling it my because I am the president. <laughs> it's the Canadian Council of the Blind. We're the largest membership-based organization in Canada. And our mandate is to promote uh, good, healthy living, help those who have already lost their vision, but also illness prevention and health promotion. So one of the things, as Dr. Wong mentioned, 20 years ago, if the current drugs were available, I would not be sitting up here with you folks. I'd be sitting down there maybe in a different perspective. That was not available for me at that time. Therefore, at, uh, first off at the age of a number of years ago, I lost vision in one eye, and 22 years ago, I lost it in the second eye. So that is a fundamental change to my entire life and independence. But now we have the choice of uh, uh, getting better treatment and making sure that the products that are available to us, the biologics that Dr. Wong mentioned, are available and prescribed and with the consent and the consultation with their ophthalmologist that we get the choice to the proper treatment in the proper length of time. And that's one of the biggest problems that we have run across that sometimes that doesn't happen, that we are made to, to take another medication maybe that is not as effective or not as well known and we can lose vision just waiting for the, the right, the, the proper drugs to be administered. And by that time, it can often be too late to, uh, to carry on and improve our sight. Great, well, so we've heard from the individual, so the, the doctor, the patient, and so now I actually wanna uh, really address uh, both uh, Dr. Beard and uh, Dr. Barrett. Um, you know, the needs of the one sometimes are at odds or counterpoise but against the needs of the many, simply because of the scale of dealing with larger populations. And so um, maybe, John, you could start you know, from, the, from your vantage point. Um, vision is one, only one of many important uh, issues that um, WHO has to deal with, and certainly only one piece of the problem uh, for aging. Um, based on sort of what you've heard on the needs of the individual, how, how does that impact, you know, sort of on an organizational level at WHO? How, how, does, how, do, how do you see vision fitting into the larger equation? Okay, well, obviously vision is absolutely critical, and as we've spoken about over this conference, we view healthy aging as the um, ability to um, be and to do the things that you have reason to value. And, and vision is absolutely critical to some of those we've heard about them, your ability to read, to drive, and so on. It also, if you lose uh, your, uh, your vision, it puts at risk many of the other capacities which are critical uh, to ability. So if you can't see, you become less physically active. Uh, and so you can have locomotor implications and, and implications in terms of the relationships you build and you, uh, you can become isolated and become depressed. So it's, a, it's an absolutely critical issue. And just to give you an idea of, uh, of the scope, the scale of this globally, um, it's estimated that over 250 million people globally uh, have moderate or severe visual impairment. A quarter of a billion people. Uh, the vast majority of them are older people, um, and 80%, or, and the vast majority of those conditions, as we've already heard, are actually now treatable. But over 80% are not receiving any treatment whatsoever. Uh, and so I think that globally, the real challenge for us is trying to think about how we can start to provide access to the treatments which we're going to hear about in some of the poorer settings of, of the world. And those poorer settings aren't necessarily just in poor countries. 
uh, because we also have to think even in rich countries there's a great diversity uh, of access and there's often in inequities in, in that access and we, start to, we, we need to be able to think about how even in the rich world we can change health systems to make sure that uh, everybody can have access to these wonderful new medicines which really can have a major impact on people's abilities. And Jane, so I'm sort of thinking about this from the International Federation of Aging's perspective, these um, breakthrough treatments that have the potential to change so many lives for the better, uh, as Dr. Beer just uh, described, um, uh, are uh, treatments that need to be administered in the doctor's office. They require particular uh, expertise and skill to be able to deliver. They're still relatively new, and like many of the new drugs, they're difficult to actually disperse to large populations, especially, and again, even in developed countries to communities that are naturally underserved, they become almost impossible to get within reach. And so, from your perspective, um, what is the, um, and from the IFA's perspective, what is it like to have this dilemma of having something that's within reach to, me, to, to some, on one hand, but not within reach to others? And how, what are you doing about it? You know, we'll, we're sitting here talking about that this is such a serious problem. You know, a quarter of a billion people that have some serious vision impairment around the world. And yet, government don't see it as serious to invest in not effective treatment. Let's actually just start with screening. You know, I think we've actually got to um, acknowledge the effective and safe treatments that are available in some countries, but we've also got to acknowledge that some people are not even able to get to a place to have their eyes screened. And then, if they can do that, then they may not even be able to afford to get to see an ophthalmologist. And when we talk about rich and poor, and I understand what we're saying, you know, the rich countries and the poor countries, but let's actually be really sit in reality and say there are poor people in every country of the world, it's relative, and some of those people live in rural and remote settings, so transportation, you know, to get to a primary care physician, let alone, you know, let, let alone an ophthalmologist. And so that's one set of dilemmas that the IFA deals with. I think the other set of dilemmas is that ageing organisations don't traditionally see vision health as a priority. And I understand that in some income security is a priority. I understand that, that um, pensions are and... and and access to healthcare systems, elder abuse, they're all vitally important. But if we have a quarter of a billion people with a serious vision impairment that is impacting on their ability to get paid work, their ability to be a volunteer, their ability to be um, a grandparent looking after their grandchildren, shouldn't we all be actually having a common agenda and working more in sync. So I think safe and effective treatment is one thing, but we actually need to actually work back and go, what are the winnable barriers that we're not addressing as a community? Can, can I also say, Will, yeah, please. because you, you said something, I, I can't remember what it was, but I think we have to be very careful not to over-medicalise this issue. Uh, and for example, even with cataract surgery, now, in the poorest countries of the world, there are trained non-medical people able to replace the lens. It takes about 10 minutes, costs about $80. Um, and here, people who are blind and their lives are transformed. And I know that some of these new interventions require careful supervision, certainly at this point in time. But I think we've got to be careful that we don't channel them into a mode of delivery that can only be delivered in that way. And I think we need to be thinking in innovative ways about how these same medications can be different, given in other circumstances by other people that become affordable and accessible. David, what do you think about that? Yeah. Excellent point. I think both of you bring up very important points. One, you, you can't treat something you don't know or you don't see. So the screening is very important. Here's an example. We just did this study 
uh, looking at Ontario, and you think Ontario, a very wealthy province within Canada, there are 1.2 million diabetics in this province. 400,000 have not had an eye exam. That means 400,000 patients have not, we don't know what their eyes are like and they have diabetic eye disease that could be visually impairing and, and vision threatening, but we don't know. So that, as Jane was saying, is very important in our screen. So we're working on getting that looked at. And in terms of exactly what you're saying, John, we're, we're, the bottleneck's happening at us right now. I can't see any more patients. Uh, like, I, I was in Oakville, I work one day a week in Oakville to service that population and that group there. But I can I can only do so much. So we are now looking at other ways to bring these therapies to a different level. Once we get very experienced at it, we can obviously like just like cataract surgery 30 years ago was in the hands of physicians. Now it's being trained, and we can give a very good algorithm, a good recipe, and then people can follow. So if we start to work on that, that's a possibility. The new thing we're working on is drugs that can last a long, long time. So maybe only show up to the doctor once every six months to a year, and then get treated, and that may be it. Hopefully we're even talking about a pill now, and even one of us were really crazy, let's put it in the water, like you know those movies, you stick it in the water and everybody's going to be cured. But that's the new science we're trying to look at, but exactly saying how to deliver this in a very effective and cost-effective manner. Mm -hmm. Luis? Yes, one of the important things that we have found, um, a lot of people have the barrier of not being able to get to their ophthalmologist or to any kind of an optometrist or anybody because of transportation and where they live. So our organization in the Ottawa area has set up a mobile eye clinic where we went into the seniors' homes, or this, like a senior complex, and have tested many eyes, 4,500 or some range around that. 65% of those people had eye conditions that were, had not been looked at for some time. And some of them were only a mere change of lenses. More were diagnosed with AMD and then referred on to ophthalmologists for proper care. And uh, diabetic macular edema was, was noted as well. So bringing care to a, a rest home or a guest home is one way of seeing a large number of people in a short time and covering more of the population in a more uh, cost-effective way. And IDC is a snow barrier, so it may be uh, sign or some other medical condition that is there as well as, as just an, an eye disease. Yeah, um, Dr. Beard, you actually made a really good point about the medicalization of, of uh, vision problems. Uh, where do you think some of the barriers are to actually being able to get screening, for example? Because you need to start with the screening in order to be able to go anywhere else. I think probably one of the biggest risks is the idea that we just create another silo to address another condition. And that we think, okay, the only way you can get your eyes checked is if you go and see an ophthalmologist. Uh, I think certainly, and, and obviously it's different in different situations, but what we need to be thinking of is much more integrated care and how we embed eye screening in part of a holistic assessment of an older person. Uh, and so that everybody, once you, you reach a certain age or a certain condition, you should have a comprehensive assessment that includes an eye assessment. And it may be that that's a screening eye assessment and then after it detects, you know, that maybe your, your, your vision is, is declining and, we, and you need to be seen, you might get referred to a more specialist service. But if we're going to rely on, okay, let's try and set up a, a series and, and make sure that every older person has an eye check, and think of that as being isolated from the rest of their care, I, I don't think we're going to succeed. And I, I think all that does is disintegrate care. And we end up with every condition being treated independently uh, and people on multiple drugs, multiple treatments, some of which interact, and we, we end up with, uh, with far from ideal care. And, and often, as, as we know, you know, the eye conditions are related to diabetes or other uh, issues, and we need to see the whole person, not to see their eye. And yet, in reality, when sort of uh, in, on the ground, these problems and barriers do exist. Otherwise, we would have more screening. And, and maybe, Dr. Barrett, do you want to reflect on where, what is the root cause of some of these barriers today and what could be done? I think it's one of them is lack of education, you know, lack of awareness around uh, the need to be screened, but also, you know, the, the work, the Diabetic Retinopathy Barometer Study, of which Canada you know, was, was one of the countries that was studied, you know, talked about 
a lack of awareness about um, the implications of diabetes, as Dr. Wong has said, but also education of family, also the um, service providers, ophthalmologists and um, and retinal specialists, you know, the protocols and guidelines that are, that are used, I mean, they're critically important as well. I think, Will, we're also talking about a very disconnected patient care pathway, right? A person care pathways. Because in the optimum world, you know, a person with diabetes, seeing a diabetologist, there would be the diabetologist talking with the person about the various complications, one of them being vision, when do you actually go and... So it is part of a coordinated care program. One of the greatest difficulties is our systems are disconnected in health. And if I think of WHO, vision sits over here and ageing and health sits over there. So, you know, we've actually got to look at our own backyard and go, well, if our backyard is disconnected, then how can we be communicating this care pathway so that the person is actually in a system that makes sense to them? Because what we understand from some of the qualitative work is a person with diabetes, one in Bolivia, had 40 appointments in one month. Now, <laughs> give me strength to try and organise myself to 40 appointments to diabetologists, to cardiologists, you know, to ophthalmologists, if I have some vision changes and I've got no family, how do I do that? So the system is disconnected and it's part of our responsibility to work as IFA does with um, NGOs such as um, CCB and, and ophthalmologists and to actually understand what the goal will be and it's what is the best outcome. And that's where I come back to government. You know, the investment in screening, you know, the short-term investment, long-term outcomes, productive nation. Louise, uh, from your perspective, have you um, encountered barriers on your, on your own? And uh, from your organization's perspective, where are the most uh, important barriers to remove from a government or policy perspective? Well, one of the big barriers, again, is people who are in, not in the cities, or not necessarily city center, are too far away and it's not a cost-effective method of getting to see their eye doctors. And because eye disease is, uh, you're probably not going to die from it, so you're going to look after all the other problems, your high blood pressure and those types of things. But the fact that with vision loss, you can have falls and injuries that can eventually cause your death because of off the, that. And that's a barrier trying to get people to understand, due to lack of education, that eye disease needs to be, your eye exams are very important. And uh, another part is to get the governments to understand that we have to work together on a nationalized strategy maybe to to help bring that all together so that it's equal across the country uh, because many places you get good eye care and in many other places you don't because we don't have the physicians that are available to people to, to get the care that they need and to go to the uh, get the treatment that they need and then the follow-up care with uh, not only eye care but there is life after vision loss. So we need to be able to work with that as we go along. Uh, what do you think about uh, what Louise was saying in terms of distance? Because this is clearly not only an issue in Canada, but in other parts of the world, it was probably magnified uh, multiple fold. What, what, um, what are your thoughts on helping to address the sort of um, uh, distance gap as a barrier? Because that's not something a policy can do, that's just sheer distance. What, what Do we bring the care out from the center? Do we try to bring people from the out and bring them into the, to the middle? What, what's the, what's, what are some solutions, do you think? Actually, anybody. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things is to, to bring the care to the people, because you can, one person can look after many people, 
rather than having many people come to a, a place that is going to cost more money. It's cheaper to put, bring one person a long distance than 20 people a long distance. So from a screening perspective, perhaps that a community health even worker more than could... Even screening, like an in-depth screening, so it's not just a very basic screening, but you know, a full service that would be the same as what you would get in the, at the very least in an optometrist's office. Right, right. John, what do you, what do you sort of No, I, I, th I think it's absolutely critical, not just for the vision, but for all sorts of health issues, that we actually provide the services as close as possible to where the person lives. That has a number of implications, because if you want to do that, you actually have to have a totally different approach to the health workforce. Um, because you'll need a lot of people who are very mobile and you know we have a limited number of ophthalmologists or whatever the specialty is. Right. So this is where, again where it comes back to exploring the roles that people play and what can, they can do. And secondly, I think we, we shouldn't overlook the role of technology and I think we sometimes get stuck in the way things are done today. I, I don't know how many times a day I use my mobile phone. And don't tell me there's not a way that my mobile phone can be a testing, uh, testing my visual acuity as I'm doing that. There must be some AI algorithm that which can look at how close I hold it or how long it takes me to read something and is that changing. I mean, I think that we have to think about how technology may help us do some of the things which previously have been done by people and, and not that you have to wear a special device but it's just integrated into the way we do live our normal lives with phones and things like that. So I think we need to think outside of the, what's delivered now and invent new ways of doing it. I think it's harder in the rich world because we often have entrenched territories and, and, and uh, sometimes in places where there's nothing it's easy, easier to create something because you don't have those competing interests. So, um, for Dr. Wong, you know, you're somebody that is able to do the screening uh, evaluations and then you can take it as far forward even into future uh, treatments that are still under testing. What is it that you're able to do and your colleagues in ophthalmology are able to do that really aren't realistic to be able to bring out to closer to where people live or, you know, what is it that, where, where does that dominion of the specialists still lie, given the fact that we're all trying to, you know, find the right setting of care? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question in terms of trying, where's that balance, right? I think that's the key. How, you know, if you look years ago, all the specialists of everything were in the teaching hospitals. That's where the power of the education, the research was. But as time has progressed, we've educated a lot of specialists that go out to the communities and you're starting to see some fantastic work done out in the communities and even now the research are there. So it is continuing out there. So what I think the big thing is what we do at the university and especially at St. Mike's where we're the largest retina group in the country is we think outside the box. So that's one of the things we do well and um, we think of that next territory to go to. So that's where we would look at things that are don't fit in the right picture. Something's not quite right. Uh, all of us are individuals. Every medicine doesn't always work on us exactly the same way. Why is that? So that's the thing that we would do, we bring out. But I think what we can do is, a bit John was saying, is your phone. So all these new technologies, we've looked at looking at taking a vision with the phone and how to accurately do that and reproduce it, even using the phone's camera to take a picture of the back or front of the eye and send that all into your doctor who, or some algorithm that can look at it and say, yes, you go, got to see somebody or you know what, that's not so urgent right now and put that in perspective. Um, that's the new technology. That's how we're going to get out there because there's clearly we're not producing enough uh, the medical people to, to supply the necessary care around, around in Canada and even in the world. So it's going to be the technology, but the idea of thinking out of the box, that's what we can do best. So just sort of to, you know, in the last part of this discussion, and we're going to open this up to questions from the audience. We have a couple of mics down here. I do want to talk about this idea of, of treatment uh, that uh, you've described at the very beginning, Dr. Wong, which is being able to accomplish something that couldn't have been done before that is transformative. And I alluded to that in my talk as well, which is that we have these tools that we don't, uh, we're not 100% certain exactly how to use them, which is why we have multiple uh, tools. Um, uh, why is autonomy of the expert, of the physician, and the experience you have, why is that so important today? 
just as we were saying earlier, is everybody's different. Um, think about it like in a highway I say to patients, it's like your shoe. Not everybody wears the same shoe, same shoe size, but everybody is slightly different. Even day to day, things change. And so, yes, there may be a, a way we say the majority of patients will be treated with this technique or this medicine, medicine, but if they don't succeed or there's a problem, as you were showing, people don't respond, that's where we have to look outside and say, okay, why did they respond? And that's why we have to tailor the new treatments or some other treatment to get to that point of where we agree with the patient, talking with patients and saying, is this what we want to go to? This is where we're going to try to go. And that's where we try to tailor to. But hasn't the CADF, the authorities, actually recently come up with a recommendation that tries to restrict the autonomy? Yeah, I think like many things in, in governments, they try to standardize things. Standardization is, is important, but there's got to be a limit to that standardization. There's got to be at some point saying, you know what, this is not working. And so, or the physician or the caregiver is going to make some decisions what's best for the patient. Not everything is, like not every drug is right for every patient. And you have to decide maybe where they're located, what their, their, their nutritional status, all these other factors have to come into play. And Jane, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can help us flesh a little bit of context out for the whole CADF decision for not everybody might be familiar with it. Can sure. you give us an overview? Sure. Look, you know, the, the IFA stands by our position that it is critically important that an ophthalmologist, a doctor, any speciality, you know, should be able to determine the most effective and safe treatment for the person in front of them. And we have a situation in Ontario where there was a recommendation um, from a body known as CADIS, you know, to, it was a recommendation, it hasn't been implemented. Um, it's a recommendation whereby um, the physician um, may have to use a particular treatment which has not been scientifically proven to be safe and effective um, for a certain group of patients. Now, IFA does not um, uh, engage in the scientific effectiveness of drugs, treatments. That's not our domain. That's the domain of um, you know, someone like Dr. Wong. But we do stand by the position that um, an older person has the right to be part of the conversation with a specialist about the most effective and safe treatment for their condition. And so that's one of the reasons why IFA is, is interested in working with organisations such as um, of CCB and CNIB and FFB and other ageing organisations because it's about the tipping point, isn't it? It's about the tipping point of um, not acknowledging, you know, the, the abilities of these physicians to determine the appropriate treatment. And Louise, are, from your perspective, are you aware or how have you become aware that there might be restrictions actually on the treatments that are being made uh, that might limit what it is that might be required for Dr. Wong to make the proper decision for a patient. How are you hearing about that and what is your response? Uh, yes, we're quite aware of it and as Jane described, we're quite involved with it as well. And the bottom line in our mind, our organization's mind, is that there has to be choice there. There has to be choice of what the ophthalmologist is providing for, in his or her opinion, as what the best treatment for that patient is. And also the patient has to be fully informed of all the choices that are out there. And by fully, I mean totally, you know, not, this is a good drug, just take it. It has to be uh, defining what the side effects could be, how it can, how long, often you have to take it, how all the problems that could arise into the future if you don't take it, and given the right to make the choice with their physician as to the proper medication to take, so, so and what, not to be regulated by. What are you doing to raise awareness on that? We uh, have many different uh, physician statements sent out to government and and to uh, health organizations. Worked with other uh, 
organizations often for the blind to get the message across and um, held education sessions in different uh, cities and towns around the country to educate people. Do you know, and I that's think one the challenge, the, sorry Louise, the challenge Will is that, that you know, Canada is unlike Australia, is unlike the US in terms of jurisdictional responsibilities. And so in Canada, it's the jurisdictional responsibility, you know, in Ontario, it's provincial. Um, and so different provinces are doing different things. And so what we have to do is just be very clear about what the message is. And the IFA has joined with CCB and many others in the ICU campaign. Because way back, we're actually having to, you know, educate, raise awareness about the importance of um, screening. Treatments, etc., and then go forward from there. Um, this is not about a negotiation with a payer. This is about saying that every single person deserves the right to safe and effective treatment, and the conversation with the appropriate specialist to determine that treatment. Because that links to function, doesn't it? It does. And, and Dr. Wong, do you think that sort of financial uh, considerations are really the primary driver for trying to restrict the use of treatments? Like all technologies, and, and it costs money, and so the question who's the payer and who's paying it? At the end of the day, my, as a physician, my allegiance is to the patient. And I 100% have to protect that patient. And if it was me, this is what I would want. But there are things going on, unfortunately, now that they're trying to change that adjustment to say the allegiance is a cost effectiveness and that's not the way as a physician we should be thinking. As that's a second or tertiary care, a uh, second event that is we should think about that but not at the expense of the patient. So as a physician that's adamant that we have their allegiance in protecting the patient 100%. And Dr. Beard, you're, you know, obviously WHO is not in the business of restricting or opening gateways for particular medications. And yet, you probably have seen from your vantage point the um, tendencies for government to use cost as a lever in order to be able to manage their treatment options for their communities. So having heard this discussion, you've got important treatments that can be uh, uh, used. There may be some limitations. Um, there's, there's already enough difficulty in even getting screening going on. And then there's this sort of geography set of challenges, and um, what's the role of government? What, what would motivate, do you think, governments? Or how, do they, how do government policymakers reconcile the sort of idea that they need to, what's the gain they have by restricting uh, uh, treatments? I think this is a really complex area. I'll go against the flow a little bit here, and saying this, and, and what I'm gonna say, it's not related to what we're talking about in Canada, because I don't know the situation at all. I mean, firstly, I believe very strongly, and WHO believes very strongly, in evidence-based care. And on key issues, we spend a lot of time and effort to try and identify which interventions work. Um, and we believe in informed consent. And I hope that as we progress, information that will become more and more available so that the patients can be truly informed. I believe in many circumstances they don't have that information at the moment and so you know that, that needs to be central. Um, I also believe that as we move towards more personalised care uh, that we need and the physician needs the flexibility to be able to tailor their treatment to that individual so it's the most effective possible and it's the physician who's really in the position to make that call. On the other hand, some of the things we're talking about, especially in the early days of development, are incredibly expensive. And sometimes the distinction between the impact that intervention may have and another intervention are very, very small. In some instances, the difference in one patient may actually fund a whole program of, of screening. Um, and, and a government is going to end up in many cases, especially in a... In a uh, uh, universal health system like Canada, the government is going to have to end up paying. And if it pays here, it can't pay there. So I can understand why they want to be involved and why they, they would somehow want to influence that balance. My experience is that bureaucracies don't often intervene in ways that are actually very, they're normally very clumsy. Uh, and I think it's probably more, uh, the, a better way to approach things is working with the care provider 
to try and inform them and delegate to them the responsibility, but make sure there's ways of them, they're being accountable in their decision making. So it does take some account of the cost. We can't ignore costs, you know. And uh, uh, but on the other hand, again, I've seen governments save money by not doing that, but they still don't invest it over here. Um, so some, somehow we need to do it better. And there's an equation to be had here because in an elderly person who has heart disease and diabetes and other maybe cognitive disorders who um, the difference between being able to see or not see might actually catalyze other catastrophic um, problems simply because they can't self do self-care. And, and in fact, often the system works the opposite way. They say, oh, look, this person's so badly off, why would we do this intervention in them? Whereas, in fact, they might be the precise person where, person where the intervention's going to have the most benefit. No, I totally agree. Yeah. So, so, so Jane, what, what could be done? I mean, it sounds like a collective effort really needs to be made, you know, not only here in Canada, but around the world, um, to be able to raise awareness, uh, get stakeholders to... Um, uh, participate in disseminating care in the best way possible, but also to be able to do that, um, design the algorithm that can help uh, solve that calculus of um, not simply the line item of a cost of a medicine, uh, any, but any medicine, frankly, but really what's in the best interest of the patient. If we're going to go to the bat for the patient, the loyalty to the patient, as Dr. Wong said, what are some ways that, from an IFA perspective, that we can actually get together to do something? Yeah, well, I have to say I'm not smart enough around the algorithm <laughs> things. But <laughs> just now. <laughs> I'm not smart enough for that. But what I can say is that unequivocally we cannot compromise on safety. It's the first thing. And we have to stand together when it comes to a question about treatment that is not evidence-based and it is questionably not safe. So that's the first thing. But to do that, it's, it's more than just talking to organisations that are focused on vision health. You know, we have to go broader. You know, we have to actually have the organisations that are representing and uh, older people. You know, the CARPs of the world, the AARPs of the world, the National Seniors of the world. You know, but also those organisations that are umbrellas, you know, long-term care associations, because surely vision health is just as important for someone that's in residential and nursing home care as it is for someone who is living independently. You know, we're actually discriminating here. We're saying, well, perhaps they actually don't need that screening as much when you're in, in residential care. Of course you do. So perhaps we're actually making those decisions and those judgments. So, you know, IFA advocates bringing unlike together. So that's why we work closely with vision organisations, ophthalmologists, you know, diabetologists, public health physicians, because we all have a stake in this game. And unless we're all at the table and understand the intricacies of coordinated care to improve vision health, then we're not going to get to the end game. But I do have to go back to the situation is the infrastructures in our healthcare systems don't support coordinated care. WHO certainly doesn't when they're working in silos and nor do governments. So what about NGOs and professional associations being the model for working together? I mean, because at the end of the day, it's the older person and if we're very lucky, we're going to be old one day. Well, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say one thing, Will, because I think often underpinning this argument is the idea that governments have in the rich world that there's a tsunami of older people coming and health systems are not going to be able to cope. They're going to send us broke, so we have to ration services and access. And I, th that's a lie. It's a political lie if somebody tells that to you. When you look historically at the increase of costs that have occurred over 20 or 30 years, they're largely driven by technology, not by population change. It's something like one or 2% is related to the change in population. It just happens to be that it's older people who use these new technologies. 
So I, I think we have to be careful when what Jane is describing that we think, okay, well, let's not provide as many services to people in institutional care because it's a way of saving money. Mm. That actually, what we should be doing is thinking much more about the new interventions that are coming in and making sure that they they are advances and that they're worth the benefit. And then, if they are, we need to look at how we equi equitably make them accessible to people. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's important that we don't have that in the back of our mind as we have discussions about healthcare, and, and it, because it ultimately leads to rationing, rationing, and the denial of services to older people and discrimination. Yeah. Did Louise, any uh, thoughts on your side for that? Uh, no, I totally agree with with what's been said here. But my thought to the audience out there is, you, if you have not had your eyes examined in the past year, go get them done and get home. I, like right, well, I want to. I want to. I want to actually invite the audience to, you know, uh, say if you can uh, come up to the microphone. Please say your name and where you're from, and uh, keep your question focused on the topic at hand. Thank you, Cynthia Stewen, IFA in New York. If somebody has a stroke, they're obviously impaired if they have a hemiparesis, and they would be referred for physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Somebody loses their vision, or begins to lose their vision, and why are they not referred by the medical community who sees them for vision rehabilitation services? As I know, Ms. Gillis will attest, you don't just go to a pharmacy and buy a long walking cane and start using it. You are trained by an orientation mobility specialist to do so. And there is evidence-based research to show how cost savings and safety is paramount for persons losing their vision. But any person with partial sight or total loss of vision can be taught to do things in a new way and maintain their independence. And that does not cost that much money. Why is that? My first question. My second question is on technology. I totally agree. We are in such a better place with technology. However, some of the day-to-day -day things that are designed, I take, for example, a microwave that's all black. Oh, it looks so sleek in your new kitchen. But you lose your vision. How are you going to find those buttons without somebody intervening to help you find an alternative way to manage your microwave? So what can we do about that? Louise, you want to comment on that? Well, in Canada, the rehabilitation services for uh, people who lose their vision is limited in many ways. The, the, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind does provide some services, but the person has to be referred by an ophthalmologist to receive that. And oftentimes, because, and I know from my own experience, when it took me a long time to even get to CNIB to admit to the fact that I had lost a lot of my vision, and like it, it should have been looked at immediately rather than six months later. So because it's not a, a, in some countries I know, that when you do lose your vision and you see an ophthalmologist, you're immediately sent into a program, uh, a rehab center for six weeks of full training of how to, to learn to live with vision loss. But that's not available here in Canada. And you do have somebody talk to you on the telephone and ask what services you may need and then if you like, you can go and get something. But many people don't have the wherewithal or the strength within them to go out and actually seek those services. So it's uh, something that has to be done. And up until just the last year or two, it is all done through charitable dollars here. But now in many of the provinces are changing over to coming out of uh, provincial funding to help pay for some of the rehab that you do get. And it's uh, it's still very, very limited and not existent in, in many places. 
Great. Another question? I'm Maya Pashovic with the National Alliance for Caregiving. And uh, I would like to thank you first for your time today and sharing your expertise with us. So I have two questions. The first one, I first would like to say that I'm very happy to hear that you uh, highlighted the importance of person-centered care because not every person with uh, a visual loss or any sensory impairment or any type of disability or condition experiences that disability in the same way. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions that we have in the society. So my first question is, how can we get uh, more businesses, the private sector, to uh, stop uh, putting this veil of discrimination and stigmatization on people with visual loss and impairment? For example, if you look at many job descriptions, one of the major requirements is you must have a driver's license, which means that people with visual impairment are completely excluded from even uh, the possibility of applying for that job. And uh, as we know, financial independence is at the core of many disability rights movements across different countries and communities. And the second question is, uh, I'm think now looking at the poster behind Dr. Wong, Age-Friendly Environments, which is one of the main themes at uh, this conference, is how can we uh, come to consensus uh, with the government and uh, the private companies and businesses to create uh, uh, environments that are accessible, not only to people without disabilities, but also to people with visual impairment and loss. How can we make it more walkable for people in big cities, uh, and how can we design and create cities where sidewalks are not being cut to expand space for cars? But how can we make it more accessible for people with visual impairment and visual loss? Jane, Thank are you. you aware of any sort of um, initiatives underway to address planning uh, to, uh, to um, help meet the needs of visually impaired? Do you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a great great couple of questions. And I think that you've, you've in, in looking at age-friendly environments, I think there's a unique opportunity. Because I see people with you know, vision loss or vision impairment as in some ways no different to those with vision. In as much as we need to create an environment that enables you and me and, and John to do what you value. And so I think that there is some answers in there, and that's a movement that's growing. I just want to come back to your, your first question, which I think is, is vital in terms of this conference, and it speaks to the heart of discrimination. And we don't do well whether we're sitting in a disability activist movement or an ageism activist movement to think in a singular way. I think there is a time to look at the similarities and differences of the issues that we are dealing with, we as individuals who are growing older and those who we work with as older people. So there's a conversation that needs to happen. The best way that I've seen um, for change to happen is to, champ to have champions. And it's not, it's not a single person. You know, if we can partner with businesses, then that influences change. So it's about having those conversations and turning the conversations into action. So I'm very happy to have you at this conference and hear those questions. If, if perhaps I just add something on the environment side, I mean we have our global network of age-friendly cities and this sort of thing is one of the, the key issues that they look at and there are very concrete things you can do. I mean you can have better like street lighting, uh, you can have clearer signage, uh, you can slow crossing speeds at intersections and things like that. And yet, you know, when you go to a, a hotel, the vast majority of older people have, uh, uh, can't read without some sort of uh, um, assistive device and spectacles. And yet when I go to the shower, I can't tell, is this the shampoo or is this the conditioner? Because people, the, the companies still don't get it, that it would help me just to have it in bigger writing and it's not going to hurt their brand. So I think there's a, a fair bit, a fair way we have to go. You know, but I've got to come back and say they don't get it. But perhaps they haven't been informed. Perhaps they yes. haven't been educated. Yes. And I think it's too quick, and I've done it too. I can't see the shampoo from the body lotion. 
Um, but I think it's our responsibility to actually start being in the being in the game of the conversation. Um, so I, I take your point; it's a good point. But let's let's us be part of the conversation. Absolutely. If I may, Louise? one of the important things is universal design. But in getting universal design, like the architectures who are building a, a new building, for instance, should be in touch with spokespersons from a varying group of people, vision loss, hearing loss, uh, people who use wheelchairs, mobility devices like that, to come in and, and explain to them what they need to do to provide, to make sure that that building is universally designed and accessible for everybody, whether it be a mother pushing a child in a stroller, or an old person with a walker, or me with a white cane. Can I also just say that often we forget that an assistive device is part of our environment, and reading glasses are obviously a very simple and cheap way that you can overcome uh, the limitations with, uh, with reading that come, often come with age. And yet globally there are 800 million people who don't have this that can cost a dollar. And, and also even, even and in the rich world we often uh, I, th I believe over medicalize the whole issue of, of reading glasses and require you to see an in many countries uh, you have to see an ophthalmologist to have your eyes tested before you can actually have a prescription pair of glasses I mean it's absurd yeah, it's uh, cool. and, and we need we need to have you know, obviously a safety net in place to make sure that people who may have other problems that are occurring are picked up, but also we need to make these things much more accessible. I tell my mom to go to the dollar store, it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> go to the dollar store, pick up yeah, the glasses, yeah. it's cheaper, it works. No, she's happy, actually. Um, but I, can I just address one thing? I think it really comes back to what everybody's here is saying. It's the education of people with to knowing that there's visual impairment and what happens when someone has arthritis with visual impairment that has some issues as they get older and certain things they're not you know thinking is faster or all these issues with the added problem with the visual impairment and it's about the education and it comes back to why things aren't designed the microwave or the pathways and it's because the people that design it aren't visually impaired mm -hmm. and that is a problem mm -hmm. and so you, the need has got to come out there the voice has got to come out for everybody who has the problem to speak out and say it in fact what we do at the university when i do when i see the young doctors first thing they do they don't get it they all have great vision we stick on a pair of glasses either with macro degeneration built into it or visual loss in the periphery and tell them walk around for a day and they suddenly get it they suddenly get yeah you know what that is really difficult now they understand what a patient is going through and that's what we should do with some designers and that's why apple is so good they put things through design people and so maybe we have to put, as we make that conversation, the designers there put it glasses with this visual problem and figure out does that work, like the microwave. That's a great example. Yeah. Well, I think we're at the end of our time of our session, so I want to thank everyone for coming and thank the panelists. Let's give them a hand. <clears throat> and I know this topic is of, of strong interest, so perhaps follow up with the, uh, Jane and her colleagues at the IFA, and she'll be happy to help put you in touch with uh, the people, the right people. Thank you all. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.